Yep. <laughs> the pussy. <laughs> our, no. our cat tiger loves being okay. Loves being involved. There's a there's a famous quote. I can't remember who said it, but it said that it's something on the lines of um, people like cats because they like to be able to stroke the tiger. That there's <laughs> they say they say there's no such thing as a domesticated cat. Right. There's only the illusion of one. Fair enough. Um, right, everybody. Okay. Good evening, everybody. We're live and ready to start. Um, so let me just give you a bit of a background to tonight. First of all, um, we had a beautiful Shabbaton with uh, uh, 10 Bethlehem girls. Irene. Really? Incredible academic, uh, Jewish studies academic accomplishment and they came on a Shabbaton to Dingley. And while they were here at uh, Dingley for Shabbos two weeks ago, um, I asked Zach if he would uh, share something, uh, something historical with the day after Purim. So he shared this in brilliant historical talk with the girls. And they asked him, I said, it was so good, could you please share it with the rest of the community? Um, and he obviously readily agreed and it worked out that the night that he was available was tonight, and tonight is we also have our Tuesday night cheer. Um, so it happens that tonight I actually have another uh, meeting that I have to go to. So it worked out well that Zach was going to do tonight's talk, um, and I would listen in. And Zach will be running tonight's talk on the topic of Purim and the ancient Persian Empire and how it plays in history. It's a brilliant talk. I listened to it two weeks ago on Shabbos and I thought it was amazing. I really wanted to share with all you guys. Zach always does a great job, um, but I'll let him actually speak for himself. So with no further ado, uh, Zach, please take it away. Thank you so much, Rabbi Hala, and thank you everybody for coming tonight. I hope that it is a worthwhile evening for you. Um, I might just recommend if you're uh, not muted um, and you don't want to be heard, then perhaps mute yourself. Obviously feel um, free to unmute if necessary, but um, always often sometimes people forget <laughs> we can hear everything. Um, so just a, a, a public service announcement. Um, can you all see my slides up there? Is that is that fine, Prime of the Persian Empire? Yes. Perfect, thank you so much. So. I want to speak tonight about um, Purim and the Persian Empire, and I'm going to be focusing really on, on, on the Persian Empire more than Purim itself, um, because whilst I feel that there is a general familiarity with the Purim story, with the Megillah and the events we're in, the Persian Empire is something that is not often discussed or understood or covered, either in Jewish history or in um, other historical studies that people might do. And this is very, very odd. And we're gonna see why that's odd and some possible explanations as to why that phenomenon of not uh, studying it as much as might otherwise be expected is the case. And if we look at the screen, the slide that I've brought up here, you're going to see an image, there's a building there. Does anybody think they can identify what that building is? The answer, I'm guessing the answer is no, and that's, that, that, that probably is good because it illustrates my point. This is the tomb of one, a person that by all rights should be one of the most famous people in global historical understanding and one of the most famous people in Jewish historical understanding, but is very much not um, in people's consciousness and awareness. And this is, of course, Cyrus the Great, one of the leaders of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. We're going to get back to that in a moment. But before we do, let's go way back to the ancient Assyrian Empire. And this was um, a, a real Middle Eastern empire of sorts. This was an empire that was originally based in Mesopotamia, what is today Iraq, um, conquered much of what is today Israel and Egypt, the great centers of the Middle East of, of, of its time. 
And uh, the Bible, the Tanakh, speaks about Nineveh as this large, powerful empire in the book of Yonah, Jonah, uh, the capital of Assyria, Nineveh. There are three capitals. One of them is called Nineveh. It's described as this great city with three days' journey length and 120,000 people. Interestingly, the city of Nineveh still exists. It's one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities of the world. Today, the city is called Mosul which was actually made the capital of ISIS, the Islamic State, when uh, they controlled it, which is interesting too. And the Assyrians had a very, very powerful um, empire that was centered very much on their very powerful military. They had this incredible war machine. And if you see here in this image, you see archers and siege engines. You see a kind of primitive um, ancient form of a tank. You see horse, horse archers, um, which is a pretty... Um, impressive thing to be able to carry off, fire arrows from a galloping horse in the middle of a battle. But it's made even more impressive when you realise that the Assyrians were doing this before the invention of the stirrup. So if you have a look at the foot of this uh, Assyrian soldier, you will see there is nothing holding their foot on. They're being held on by, pardon my French, but their posterior is literally hold them on this galloping horse as they are firing arrows in the heat of battle an incredible, an incredible skill. Uh, and the Assyrians were famous for their military, um, but they were also famous, equally famous or infamous for um, uh, the, the, the military techniques they used, such as this ancient form of a Navy seal. This is actually someone underwater. So if you build a moat to surround your city and protect yourself, that won't help you from the Assyrians. They have a goat skin there full of air to be able to enter your city during a siege. And they loved violence, not just violence in conflict itself, but violence as a punishment, as a tool of intimidation of anybody that threatened their rule. And these are carvings of uh, 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 prisoners being ritually strangled. And here are Assyrians flaying their prisoners alive, which means literally the removing of skin while people are alive. And what's important to note about the Assyrians is there's been plenty of monstrous empires and states throughout history, but they often try to hide their crimes. The Assyrians didn't hide their crimes. They carved them on the walls of their cities and of their palaces. Because what the ancient Assyrians said to themselves was that in 2022, there will be a shiur online for Chabad Dingli, and they will speak about the ancient Assyrians. And what we want them to know about us is that we flay people alive. They were proud of this. Um, and they were terrifying. And if you look at the way the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible, speaks about the ancient Assyrians, they have a pretty bad rap. Um, they are spoken of as people that besiege and attack and slaughter and deport and murder. And indeed, they do conquer the northern kingdom of Israel. And the 10 lost tribes that are famously spoken of are lost to the Assyrians. But ultimately, this catches up with them. And the other empires, the other powers in ancient Mesopotamia, what is today Iraq, rise up against the Assyrians and conquer them and they are replaced with the Babylonian Empire. But the Babylonian Empire isn't that much better. They too conquer uh, the kingdom of Judah in the south. They destroy the temple in Jerusalem, um, and they uh, destroy uh, that Jewish sovereignty and independence that exists at that time. And they also have um, a pretty horrific practice um, which they undertake to King Zedekiah, the last free independent king of Judah, whereby they kill his two sons in front of him and then blind him so that the last vision he will ever have is the murder of his two sons. And they actually take Zedekiah and the royal household of Judah and they take them into captivity in Babylon. Now, this king of the Babylonians is called Nebuchadnezzar II, and Rembrandt uh, painted him looking rather distraught because indeed it is recounted in the Tanakh that as a consequence of his crimes, uh, Nebuchadnezzar goes mad, he goes insane, and he's kept almost like a dog in the basement of the Babylonian palace. But his grandson, some say his son, is a king named Belshazzar or Belshazzar in 
uh, Hebrew and Aramaic. And he takes over from Nebuchadnezzar, and he too has great feasts in his palace using the um, uh, vessels, the golden vessels from the temple in Jerusalem destroyed by his grandfather. And have every, any of you ever heard of the saying, the writings on the wall? Well, it comes from Belshazzar, because indeed there is an account in the Tanakh, in the book of Daniel of Belshazzar, that in this feast where he's using the vessels of the temple, a ghostly hand appears and writes a series of letters on the wall. And nobody knows what these letters mean. And so the prophet Daniel is called in to interpret. And he reads it as follows. Mene, mene, tekel, ufarsin. You, Belshazzar, and the Babylonians have been weighed. You have been measured. You've been judged. And you have failed that test. And the consequence, a play on words, farsin, paras means both Persia, but lifros also means to tear apart. You will be torn apart by the Persians. And indeed, the Persians come next. Whereas what we read in yellow earlier about the Babylonians and the Mesopotamians as a whole is very, very negative. They are these uh, uh, horrible, destructive people in the eyes of the Tanakh. Cyrus and the Persians are seen as very, very positive, that it's God that stirs up the spirit of Cyrus and tells him to liberate the people captured by the Babylonians, including the Jews, and allow them to return to their homeland. So the Persians conquer the Babylonian Empire and they create what was then by far the largest empire the world had ever seen. This was an empire that didn't just constitute the Middle East, but all the way into what is today Greece in Europe and Ukraine, uh, into well into Asia. Um, and Cyrus the Great is this the, 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 the most significant leader in this early stage of the Persian Empire. And when we read the Megillah of Esther, the scroll of Esther on Purim, we read that the Persian kingdom was from Hodu Vad Kush, from India to Ethiopia. And this was really true. This was incredibly large multicultural empire with dozens of cultures, religions, ethnicities within it. And whereas the Babylonians, whether that was the Assyrians or the um, Babylonians, sorry, the Mesopotamians, ruled by force, ruled with cruelty, expelled and banned people and destroyed people's religions and cultures, the Persians allow people to do as they wish, more or less. Xenophon, a Greek author from the time, said, and those who were subject to him, meaning Cyrus, he treated with esteem and regard as if they were his own children. While his subjects themselves respected Cyrus as their father, what other man but Cyrus, after having overturned an empire, ever died with the title of the father from the people who he had brought under his power? For it is plain fact that it is a name for one that bestows rather than one who takes away. And this is a Jewish view too. If we look in the book of Isaiah, Yeshayahu, it says, thus says the Lord to his anointed. The Hebrew here anointed is actually Meshechav. Cyrus is the only non-Jew in the entire Jewish Bible who receives the title of Mashiach, anointed by God, whom he has taken by his right hand to subdue nations before him and strip the loins of kings. Um, if we look at Ezra, all the kingdoms of the earth have the Lord, the God of heaven, given me, meaning Cyrus, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah, in Yehuda. And we don't have a lot of Persian sources. In fact, we have shockingly few Persian sources. And there's a number of reasons for this that I'll get to. But one of the most important that we do have is something called the Cyrus Cylinder. And um, I'm not going to explain this to you because I will let the director of the British Museum himself, where it is housed, do so. But one thing that I'm going to do, I think I haven't allowed um, sound, so I might just bring this up again and do so. I think that should work. Give me one moment. All right, once I play this, just uh, maybe somebody give me a thumbs up to know that it's you can hear it. This is probably the first moment in history that we know of a ruler thinking about how he's going to manage a multicultural state. Mm -hmm. 
The object behind me is known as the Cyrus Cylinder, and it's made of baked clay, and it was buried at the foundation of a building in Babylon about 2,600 years ago, in fact, in 539 BC. And what it is, is a declaration by the king of Persia, Cyrus, who has just conquered Babylon. And he's telling us what he's going to do. Babylon in 539 is ruled by Belshazzar. Um, and Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar, the kings of Babylon, are the kings who had sacked Jerusalem, brought the Jews to Babylon, imprisoned them, brought all kinds of other people to Babylon and imprisoned them. And Cyrus, the king of Persia, is going to set the people free. What he's going to do is allow people to go home and resume their religious life. Different religions, different people in different places. The Persian Empire is the first empire to have to run in different languages and to accommodate different faiths. So it's always been a point of reference. Cyrus has always been a point of reference to people wondering how you rule a society with different religions, different traditions without people fighting. So it's very important to us today because all our big cities have people of different religions, different languages. But he's particularly important to the United States because in the 18th century, when the founding fathers are thinking, how will we make a country where different faiths are all respected, but there's no state religion, they look to Cyrus. And Thomas Jefferson studies Cyrus. He tells his grandson to study Cyrus. And the US Constitution is in some ways the direct descendant of this cylinder. I hope that the visitor will, looking at this object, will understand that for any Iranian, this is part of their great history. Just as any Italian knows he's the heir of the Roman Empire, every Iranian knows they are the heir of Cyrus and that great tolerant empire that shaped the Middle East two and a half thousand years ago. And that the ideas and the ideals of the Persian Empire are very close to the ideals and ideas of the modern United States. So incredibly significant from a historical perspective, from a cultural perspective, from a political perspective, mirrored both in the physical uh, archaeological history and also very much in the Jewish history. Again, the only non-Jewish person in the entire Tanakh to be called Meshichab, the anointed, the Messiah, uh, in, 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 in the biblical sense. And uh, these are coins called um, the Yehud coins, which are the earliest Jewish coins ever in history. And they were minted in the Jewish state of Judea that was part of the Persian Empire. The Jews had a level of autonomy within the Persian Empire, were ultimately allowed to build their uh, second temple. Um, and it was in the Persian context world that the Jewish people had this. Um, why did Cyrus the Great do this? What was his influence? So there were many influences and things that we can imagine. One of them likely was his religion, which uh, is was Zoroastrianism. Um, and Zoroastrianism is quite a complex religion. It's often mistakenly identified as dualist, believing in two gods, but it's not really. It is a monotheistic religion um, with some inter interesting uh, uh, elements. Uh, these are called Towers of, silent, of Silence, um, which still exist today, and Zoroastrianism still exists today. Um, where the Zoroastrians believe that uh, the human body, once a human passed, was particularly uh, ritually impure. And so they actually would, and till today, leave their deceased in these towers to be exposed for vultures to consume them, which is obviously rather unusual. Um, but they believed that fire was particularly pure or holy. Um, and so they're often mistakenly identified as fire worshippers. They don't worship fire. They just believe that it is particularly important um, and it is uh, central to many of their um, rituals. Um, and it's a fascinating religion. And one element of uh, Zoroastrianism that was almost unique in the ancient world is Zoroastrians didn't believe in slavery. They basically didn't have slaves in Zoroastrian 
civilization in ancient Persia in its entirety um, at different times. The, you know, that changed in other times as well, but slavery was something very much uh, rejected in contrast to the vast majority of ancient civilizations. We have the great capital of Persepolis. It was originally Pescade, then it was Persepolis, um, which stands entirely in ruins. And it's in ruins because it was destroyed by a little upstart at that time who was at the very fringe of the Persian Empire and decided to tear the whole thing down. His name was Alexander the Great, and he burned the Persian capital, including the entire royal library. And that is one of the reasons why we have almost no sources from the ancient Persians themselves, other than what we've found by accident, such as the Cyrus Cylinder. But here are the ruins of Persepolis, an incredible uh, 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 city in the ancient world um, and some of the archaeological remains from Persian civilization. Again, we're talking about over 2,000 years ago, an incredible, incredible culture in so many ways. And of course, the tomb of Cyrus the Great himself. And of Cyrus's tomb, he said, or he carved on his tomb, O oh man, whoever you are, from wherever you come, for I know you will come, I am Cyrus, who founded the Persian Empire and was king of all Asia. Allow me this little earth that covers my body. And there's a great irony here, because for Cyrus, it was quite obvious that he would be remembered as this significant historical figure, whereas when we sit here, we realise that perhaps not so, certainly not in the Western world. And if you ask historian Patrick Hunt, he will tell you, if you are looking at the greatest personages in history who affected the world, Cyrus the Great is one of the few who deserves that epitaph, the one who deserves to be called the Great. The empire over which Cyrus ruled was the largest the ancient world had ever seen and may be to this day the largest empire ever. And indeed, there were a series of ancient Persian kings. Um, this is the Greek account, 13 kings. Uh, the Jewish account has four. Um, and these discrepancies, again, can be contrasted by the fact neither of these are the Persian count. The Greek is not necessarily more authoritative than the Jewish by any means. Um, but uh, there's a great lack of clarity as to if these names refer to one person, multiple people, if there were names or aliases, if there were private names versus royal names. It's a very confusing matter that I'm not going to go into great detail of, but suffice to say that this was, by every conceivable account, an incredibly large, powerful and significant empire, and also an incredibly tolerant and multicultural empire in a model that's probably far closer to what um, we imagine as being um, admirable today than any other of the ancient empires of the ancient world. But if this is the case, why don't we know about ancient Persia? Why is this not in our conscience? Why do we think of Rome and Egypt and others, but Persia is kind of seen as peripheral? And why, when Hollywood portrays ancient Persia, do they portray the ancient Persian kings like this? This is a portrayal of Xerxes, um, one possible explanation for, for the uh, Greek name as a, of Ahasuerus um, is Xerxes, or as it was in Persian, Acharxerxes, quite similar to Ahasuerus perhaps. Um, and he's portrayed, this was a film called 300 from not that long ago, as this incredibly authoritarian, oppressive king who wanted to destroy the freedom of Europe uh, in the name of slavery and oppression. And we know this isn't true because they didn't even have sl slavery for much of the Persian Empire. Um, and this has its roots in the fact that when ancient Greek civilization was developing, this was a peripheral civilization, a backwater of sorts, on the edge of the quote-unquote civilized world, which was the Persian world. And just like any empire, any culture, any civilization trying to make its name for itself, you make your name in contrast to the most powerful player on the block. And that was the Persia of the time. And so the ancient Greeks um, identified Persia as um, this, this very negative um, civilization, this very negative empire, the evil empire in their own eyes. And we don't have the Persian accounts, but we do have the Greek accounts. And the Greek accounts have kind of had some historical authority on the popular consciousness, which has very much distorted the true historical 
legacy and made us perhaps uh, downplay the significance of ancient Persia. But then when we think about it, um, view it in a, in a negative light that it doesn't really deserve. Um, but indeed, it, it was this incredible civilization. And the uh, remains, even from when we're speaking about from the time of the Megillah, are very, very uh, uh, significant. The city of Shushan, called Susa today in Iran, is a real city, a real place. Here are the ancient aqueducts, even from that from, from the ancient Persian period. We have the tomb of Daniel still there in uh, the city. You can see it here. And we also have what is identified by the Jews of um, Shushan or of Susa, the tombs of Esther and Mordechai. This is in Iran today. There are still uh, prayers held in the tomb. <laughs> And of course, there are still some 10 to 20,000 Jews in Iran in totality, um, living obviously a rather precarious um, existence um, with the current political climate that exists. But they are still there since the time of the Megillah, as discussed. And the legacy of Persia, of ancient Persia, is absolutely enormous. It is the Persians who, for the first time, connect what they called the Royal Road, but what we might call today the Silk Road, connecting the um, worlds of Asia, of India and China to the Middle East and further on to Europe. And across this entire breadth of Central Asia, it is Persian culture, whether it's in Uzbekistan, in Turkmenistan, in Kazakhstan, in Iran itself, um, in Bukhara, in India, such as uh, the Taj Mahal, these are all remnants of Persian heritage and cultural legacy, which has been dominant throughout so much of the world. Um, and a great uh, um, kind of, uh, I don't know if you call it ironic or kind of uh, um, fluke of history or however you want to determine it, is the story of the Shah of Iran. So the Shah of Iran was the last king of Iran who ruled up till 1979 when there was the Islamic Revolution, which brought into existence the current um, government and model of the country of Iran. But the Shah claimed to be, although it's, 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 it's probably not historically accurate, um, the direct descendant of Cyrus the Great, the founder of this empire. Um, and he had a feast in the early 70s to commemorate the 2,500-year founding of this empire by Cyrus the Great. And when we look at the Megillah of Esther and we look at the feast of Achashverosh that exists there, there are unbelievable parallels between that feast and the events that occurred there and that of um, the Shah of Iran. And they, they called it the peacock throne that he sat on. And there was, for what was you know, a, a, a developing country at the time that had incredible energy resources and wealth from that side, but not a particularly developed economy, um, the wealth and the opulence and the luxury and the waste that was spread by um, the Shah at his time was on a level unparalleled. 
um, and his party to celebrate the 2,500 year founding of the Persian Empire by Cyrus the Great has been called the greatest party in history or the most expensive party in history. And just to give a few examples of what occurred there, the heads of state, kings and queens of every country on earth were invited. Many of them attended. They spent two years clearing the area outside of Pescade, the, the previous capital of snakes, scorpions, spiders, any kind of insects that could be there, planting trees. They had tents set up in the desert for every single guest. And when I say tent, don't confuse this for any kind of campering or lack of luxury. These were air conditioned, heated, fully serviced. Every single guest received a solid gold embossed commemorative ashtray to take home from the event. The food in a country like Iran that has an incredible culinary tradition was not Iranian, but was flown fresh directly from the Shah's favorite restaurant, which was Maxim's in Paris where all of the food was flown in from. Um, there were red Rolls-Royce limousines used to transport guests every single direction and way that they would wish to go. This was an incredible party. Um, and to show you some of the uh, proceedings, I have a clip here that you can see to get a sense of the scale, um, commemorating the modern and ancient Persian armies. <laughs> in case you wondered otherwise, Iranian civilians themselves were not invited to this event, were banned from attending, and this cost literally hundreds of millions of dollars in today's money. Um, and it is uh, said with no jest that it is the obscenity and the extremes of this party that actually played no small part, many say, for um, the, the antagonism of the Shah by many in the Iranian population, which ultimately allowed the revolution in 1979, which ousted him to take place with, you know, I think we could all agree quite negative consequences for ultimately the Iranian people, if not the rest of the world. A, a, a somewhat a Khash Varosh figure, I'm sure you would agree in many, many ways. And since that revolution in 1979, um, there has been an attempt by Iran to very much uh, recreate the ancient Persian Empire, not a Zoroastrian tolerant empire, but a fundamentalist Shia empire, um, which has its uh, expression in Hezbollah, in Lebanon, in the Houthis, in Yemen, in um, many of the uh, 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 forces in Iraq and Syria. Um, and indeed, it's, it, it is quite incredible how history repeats itself. The 2,500 years later, after Cyrus the Great, there is a revival, as there has been again and again throughout history, of the Persian Empire, so to speak, in the Middle East and beyond. And so I'm, um, I, I, I really do think that 
it's important to note a few things. One is um, of, of, of significant note. When we look at the Jewish Bible, we have to remember that the Torah, the Tanakh, sorry, the Torah Nevi'im V'Ketuvim was canonized at a certain point. It was canonized um, after the Second Temple era, around the Second Temple era. And there were decisions made about what would be included and what would not. Uh, perhaps most famously, the records of the Maccabees and the Hashmanaim were not included because they ultimately ended up to being somewhat disappointing and it was said that it was not appropriate, even though these were important uh, accounts, for them to be in the Jewish canon formalised, so to speak. So it was very much a considered uh, a, a matter, what would be in the Jewish Bible, what would be in the Tanakh um, and where. Does anybody know of what the Tanakh ends, what the final words of the Tanakh are, and who says them? The final person to speak in the Tanakh, in the Jewish Bible, is Cyrus the Great. In Divrei Amim, in the Book of Chronicles, these are the last words. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. That he made a proclamation throughout the his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth have the Lord, the God of heaven, given me. And he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. That's the temple. Whosoever there is amongst you of all these people, the Lord is God. Be with him. Let him go up. Thus ends the Tanakh. It's, it, 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 it couldn't be more significant. Yet somehow, for whatever reason, and I can't help but feel that it's part of that broader um, global historical view which sees the Persian Empire as either less important or, or negative somehow, that something's been distorted here, something's been lost here. Because Cyrus the Great clearly does represent, from a Jewish perspective, an admirable model of leadership, an admirable model of governance. Um, beyond the Jewish context, it's not a Jewish individual, that the tolerance, that the freedom inherent in uh, Cyrus's empire is viewed by contrast to the Babylonians and Assyrians as a good thing, as a positive thing. And then when we see the accounts of Cyrus and the Persians in the Tanakh, when we see the accounts of the Megillah, we see a, a clear historical repetition. These themes repeat themselves again and again and again. And I think that if we um, forget the context of the Megillah, we, we're losing something. We've lost something because the context is so rich and so meaningful. And I've spoken for 40 minutes tonight, and I'm going to stop to allow time for questions. But I, by, I hope that this is a tiny little snippet, a tiny little window into this whole universe of thought historically that we very rarely have. And that's why I like to call this the Persian, Purim in the Persian Empire, the greatest story never taught. Because nobody's speaking about this, but I'm sure, I hope you will agree, I've done my job well, that it's definitely worth speaking about. So thank you very, very much. And um, any questions that there may be, I'm very happy to answer or do my best attempt at answering. Nothing at all. I always tell my students that if there are no questions at the end of a lesson, that's a sign of either the very best of lessons or the very worst of lessons. That's <laughs> so I'll it was very good. Thank you. Yeah. I'll try to have a positive spin. No. All right. Well, if there are no questions, thank you, Hazel. Thank you so much. If there are no questions, then I um, thank you all very, very much. I hope that was a, a good use of your Tuesday night. And um, we'll speak soon. And if you have questions later, send them through to me. I'll be glad to. I have a to... question. Oh, yes, please. Is it, uh, you mentioned uh, as a historical fact, it's, we talk about Cyrus and great empire. Is it, you can put some, some future view on that. It's what could that mean for the Jewish state? Yeah. What means this for the Jewish uh, as a story will be repeated? Uh, look, it's a <laughs> final words in a, our big, biggest and best book. 
So what is this? What is a sort of a repercussion for us, or what the future for us? Looking through uh, that perspective, I think um, you know one of the one of one of the most dangerous things one could do is predict the future because you'll always be wrong. No, no, look, <laughs> we're not asking you to be uh, look no, perfect, no, but we just <laughs> yeah. I think you know. To me, this your is what you. It's a your what your yeah. view on that. My, what what this says to me is. A few things. One is certainly in a in a physical sense, physical political sense, the Jewish desire is not, nor has it ever been, to rule the world, so to, so to speak. There's never been a Jewish desire to have some kind of global empire, a physical political empire, to rule the world and subject <laughs> other people to, to, you know, a Jewish worldview or, or, or whatnot. Um, but we do live in a world where there is, there are political systems and there are governance systems. And um, I think Judaism and, and, and anybody reasonable and logical will say chaos, anarchy is rarely positive, rarely leads to, to something good. And when we speak about the Noahide laws that are obligatory in all humanity, one of them is to have a system of courts, have a system of governance, because that's what humanity needs. And, 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 and is it gonna be perfect? No, it'll never be perfect, but you need to have structures of, of, of allowing people to live a safe uh, life. And within that context, a lot of the examples that the Tanakh can look at or that we can look at history are really bad the assyrian example right the flaying people alive and then carving it into walls to be remembered then we can all agree none of us would want to live in a world where that is the norm and fortunately in many places it is the norm even right now as we speak but cyrus had a different model i'm i, I imagine cyrus had to do some some pretty nasty things to get where he got as well but at least in, 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 on, on, a, on, a, on a large level, on a macro level, the vision was a vision of um, allowing people to, to, to live as they wish to live. Um, and in particular, allowing the Jews to be <coughs> Jews. Um, and I think what the Tanakh is saying here, that that is meaningful, that's powerful. And when those opportunities present themselves, take advantage of it. When Cyrus says, you can go up and you can live your life as your people in your land, and over a bead, that, that you have to grab these opportunities, that you have to see that God's hand works through the whole world, the whole universe, the whole of humanity. And... Um, that's important. And I, and I do think it's incredibly telling, you know, the word Meshichav is anointed, is used for Cyrus and Ezra, not here. Um, you know, that, that, that is, that is uh, the Tanakh saying something. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's how, I, how I see it, if, if that helps. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> I was just going to ask you, uh, What's the situation now, given the situation with uh, Iran and Israel, with the Jewish community? We we're saying about ten to twenty thousand uh, still in the Iran Jewish community. What's their situation? So I think one. There's a few layers. The Iranians, um, I think, very much like to be able to say and use the local Jewish community as evidence that they are not anti-Semitic, they are anti-Zionist. Well, they're not against Jews, they're against Israel. Um, I would argue that the two, you can't, you can't actually effectively separate them, and um, it's, it's, a false, it's a false paradigm. But they like to be able to say it, and um, they do things that are tokenistic, such as guaranteeing two seats in the Iranian parliament for Jewish members, the, the parliament has no power, right? So it's, it's, it's highly tokenistic. And certainly those two don't have any power. Um, and, and the Jewish communal leadership, as much as one could call it there, you know, a condition of, of them being leaders is publicly condemning Israel and making public statements saying, you know, we as Jews uh, support the Iranian regime and condemn the state of Israel. And so they're in somewhat of a golden cage um, because... Their physical safety, for the most part, 
is protected, right? Like I think that they're probably safer than Jews would have been in areas of Yemen where the Houthis were in control or um, in, in, in some other parts of the Middle East or the world. Uh, but at the same time, it's certainly not a, a true freedom. And, uh, you know, they're not allowed to speak their minds or, 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 or speak as they wish. Um, they also have, um, uh, uh, you know, various bizarre restrictions. Um, it's actually very, like the Iranian, I know this, this might sound ironic and bizarre, but the Iranian regime, based on my understanding from Iranian Jews that I've met and spoken to, a few I've had the privilege to know throughout my life, the Iranian state, as it is, the Islamic Republic, actually enforces Jewish practice, right? Because in Iran, um, everybody has to be observant, whether that's observant of Shia Islam, which is the, the state religion, or observant of whatever protected minority religion they're part of. Um, so, you know, the, the Iranian regime likes to present Jews as being this kind of archetype that fits their narrative and everything that comes with that. Um, some of them serve in the, in the Iranian military. I don't, I don't know how many do so willingly, but there is national service. Um, there are some that travel out and in clandestinely and, and openly. Um, I, 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 I don't think, you know, it's, it's necessarily that pleasant, I, but, but, I, but I think it is relatively, I don't think they're at, they're at risk of their, you know, of their lives on a daily basis, but they can't speak as freely. And there were some arrested and accused of spying and executed uh, 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 in, in, the, in the early 2000s. And yeah, I, you know, there's been worse examples of Jewish existence throughout history, but I don't think it's amongst the best. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. All right. Well, thank you so, so much, everybody. It's been my pleasure. I hope you enjoyed. Um, and I thank uh, the Hallers and Chabad Dingley, as always, is giving me the platform to be able to speak and present and look forward to seeing you all and speaking soon. So thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see you, Yochanan. Good to see you too. And everybody. <laughs> Yochanan's uh, in Queensland, everybody, so I don't get to see him as much. No, I'm, I'm at Mission Beach at the moment. Oh, no. <laughs> you yourself. Yeah. Yeah. All right, see you, everybody. Thank you so right. much. Bye. 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 Thank you.